Hello, welcome to the first of our special festive Beyond the Ice podcast. I'm Nadia Frontier, a marine biologist here at the British Antarctic Survey. This time last year, I was in Antarctica working at Rothera Research Station on the West Antarctic Peninsula. Today, I'm back to the headquarters in Cambridge. In these podcasts, we're aiming to give you an insight into what it's like to live and work in Antarctica, particularly at this time of year. With me for the conversation, I'm joined from Rothera Research Station in Antarctica with Matt Hughes, Joe Cole and Aurelia Highchard. Welcome, all of you. Can you just give me an idea as to what view you're looking at right now? So right now we are all sat in the library, which is in one of our communal buildings where we come to have dinner and socialise. And out of the view at the moment, I can see the ramp, which is a really snowy slope that we can go and ski and snowboard on. And it's beautiful sunshine today. We've got some clouds in the sky, but it's super bright outside. So it's actually a little bit painful to look out the window without sunglasses on. But I can see some people going up the ramp on skidoos and it's a hive of activity outside with lots of construction and people at work. Um, Yeah, but it's a beautiful day outside. I miss that so much. I hope that you'll be going out after work and making the most of that almost 24 hours of daylight and going for some skis on the ramp. Yeah, definitely. Well, me and Ray went out yesterday for a walk. Yeah, we went out for a walk around the point uh, yesterday after work. We were thinking about going up the ramp. Turned out it was a bit breezy. And um, instead, we went for a lovely walk, what we call around the point, which is along the coast um, near our station. And we saw a lot of penguins, some seals and just really beautiful views of the icebergs and the peninsula that we can see from our island. And yeah, it's just really nice to de-stress like that after work. You just, Definitely. yeah, clear your head, have some chats. You're making me so jealous. Let's move on. <laughs> Matt Hughes, could you please tell us what your day to day involves? Well, I'll take you through today, actually, because we've got quite a lot of interesting things going on. So I work up in our ops tower, which is a bit like an air traffic control tower here. We've got five different aircraft that we have fly around the continent, bringing people in and out of the continent, but also off doing lots of science and taking our science teams out and about. So today actually started bright and early for me. I was uh, up in the tower at 5.30 this morning, and that's because we're facilitating a big airdrop uh, down at one of our field locations called Sky Blue. So fuel's really important to enabling us to do the science that we want to do. So we've got a really big cargo plane uh, in Punta Arenas that's about to take off shortly, and they'll be flying down and just throwing drums on parachutes out the back of the aeroplane and uh, stocking all of that up. But also we've got flying that happens here from Rothera going to various places. We've got two aircraft flying in the deep field at the moment, putting in a science team to do some drilling in the Pensacola Mountains. And so my job's really just speaking with the aeroplanes and the field teams uh, all day. So it's uh, quite a busy day for us today. That sounds so busy. How many people do you have working in the tower with you? Uh, Including me, there's six of us in the tower team this year. But there's usually two of us up in the tower at any time because we can cover things all through the day. So sometimes we'll have really late flying going on until three or four in the morning in the deep field. So, uh, yeah, there's a big team of us just to try and facilitate that should it happen. Joe, what have you been up to today? Well, today's been a bit of a manic one for me because I uh, found out last night at about 10 o'clock that um, I'm actually going to be heading out to the field this afternoon. So I've been manically packing all of my cold weather gear, getting my big down jacket, some, some booties as well, so I can stay nice and warm and getting all of my bits together. And then coming to talk to you, obviously, and then straight after this podcast, I'm actually getting on a plane and heading out to Sky Blue to go and do the weather and some of the comms out there for the team. I'm a meteorologist is my background. um, So I'm going out to do some of the weather observing out there so that we can support the airdrop and um, the teams that are in the field and getting out further into the field. That is excellent. You're going to do the airdrop. How many days will you be out at Sky Blue, which is one of our Antarctic petrol stations? Yeah, I don't really know. Um, I don't think you ever really know when you're going to these places. You basically get told by the field operations manager, oh, you're going out. Oh, yeah, it'll probably be a couple of days. But you never know. So I think at least a couple of days, but it all depends on the weather here. So the Antarctic weather is pretty changeable. So you can be out in one place and it can be absolutely gorgeous. And then the next day it can be like 50 knot winds and blowing snow and the planes aren't able to come and pick you up. So hopefully a few days, but who knows? We'll find out. Home for Christmas is what I hope. (laughs) Home for Christmas. Home being Rothera. Aurelia, what have you been doing today? So my days these days are very um, 
I'm predictable and very changeable, so I never really know uh, what's going to happen um, when I go and turn up in my office in the morning. Could be anything this morning. I've been uh, dealing with a few um, health and safety reports and kind of mopping up some paperwork that has accumulated in the background. I try to always have my desk clear so that I can respond to something urgent that comes up at any point in time. To give you the background, um, I'm the station leader here at Rothera, and I believe that it's really important to be available for everyone's concerns at all times. So if there's nothing going on, then I uh, need to clear all my backlog that I have reporting and sort of investigations that I need to do and just sort of maintenance tasks. So that in case someone comes through my door with a problem or something crops up, I can respond to that uh, straight away with a clear head. Yeah, which is really important because there's such a community on station, isn't there, of like people working together. So having that open door um, as a station leader is really, I think, really positive on station and makes a really nice environment. Yeah, absolutely. Because we've got um, we've got a lot of people from different teams and some have their managers and their points of contact here. Some others don't. But no one really, apart from me, has a kind of overall responsibility for the social side of things and for people just as people down here. So I don't really look after people's work as such. I'm more here to look after the community from a people side of things. So, yeah, I think that's really important. I think it's really important to be available um, at all times to people especially at this time of the year when things are going on maybe back at home people miss home a little bit and um, at the same time it's really busy here so you're kind of caught in this weird situation where people at home are starting to slow down get cozy for the holidays and um, things are ramping up massively here with our airdrop with construction with people going into the field it's the best time of year now in terms of weather for outside projects so it's really busy so I try to be there for people with you know if there's things going on at home or if they just want to vent or if there's you know they just want to have a quick chat that kind of stuff and she's got a really great advent calendar at the moment a shared advent calendar that's going on where you can go into the office and each day someone new gets to open the chocolate so uh, that's pretty nice well i didn't i didn't know about this did you not open one no you missed out (laughs) eloise came and mopped up the last three from the last three days this morning what yeah outrageous i would like to know aurelia why did you not have such a calendar when you were the Bonner lab manager because this is your first year of taking such a high responsibility position looking after 170 people but before that you were responsible for marine science for the last five years why did we not have an advent calendar <laughs> well I continuously thrive to improve and it just so happened that um, there is a chocolate advent calendar in my office this year I think I'm gonna I might make it permanent because it's um yeah it's quite a success People really appreciate that. But yeah, as you said, it's my first season as summer station leader here at Rothera. And um, yeah, it's it's a massive step up for me in taking on responsibility before I was responsible for the Bonner Lab and um, the safe running of that facility and looking after the scientists that are doing their work down there, which is really important, but stepping it up to being responsible for the entire station and our overall operations and, and conducting it safely and making sure everyone's doing all right and things are staying in balance is yeah it's a it's an incredible challenge and uh, so far I find it incredibly rewarding that's so so good to hear you talked about the sense of community how is everybody getting on together and gelling together towards that Christmas spirit yeah it's really nice actually there's uh for me it's my third season down here and along with Joe and Ray uh, we've been coming down for a while now. So you've already got some nice, good friends in your community here, but you're always meeting new people. We've got a lot of people from different industry. We've got a lot of construction people down here at the moment. And yeah, it's nice getting to know new people, making sure people are settling in nicely to station. And you, you make some good friends pretty quickly, I think, down here. Yeah. yeah, you do. And people are definitely coming together with the Christmas spirit at the moment. In fact, Aurelia, I didn't even tell you this yet, but uh, Tash, who is one of our SSAs, so our station support assistant, uh, is going to organise Fuchs Cinema, which is a like a cinema experience we put on at Christmas in one of our um, field rooms, uh, which is called Fuchs is the building. And we basically put out a load of beanbag type things and um, sheep skins and make a really cozy, nice, like 
think Apre Ski in France. And we basically got an Apre cinema where we put on Christmas movies, which is super nice. So um, she's planning on organising that now. And that's part of the community is everyone coming together with an idea and putting on different things. And we're going to try and do some caroling next week, which should be good fun. Oh, that's such good news. Um, there's a few things that we do like Fuchs Cinema, which are sort of traditional. But like Joel says, it takes someone from the community to go and organise it. Um, so it's really good news. I didn't know she was going to do that. I was a bit worried you leaving because Joe is one of our driving organisers within the community <laughs> um, who's always keen to bring people together and keen to put um, events on. So that's really good. Fuchs Cinema is a massive one. We have a whole range of films. We go from the classics such as Die Hard to... I'm a Home um, Alone girl. Home, Home Alone. Alone. Yeah, also that. Elf has... Uh, what did we have? We had... Um, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. So there's a spread and to suit all people's wishes as well. And um, we try to do uh, mulled wine. We've already had some baking going on. People going into the kitchen after work and doing some biscuit baking. There's going to be mince pies going on as well. So, yeah, it's really tricky involving the community while everyone's busy doing their job, but also trying, you know, to get people to think, what would you like for to get this Christmas spirit on the go? Because it, it takes a certain bit of effort to carry to get this momentum going. And then it's a self perpetuating thing. Nadia, you'll be um, glad to know that I've taken over your secret Santa role. So you organised it last year very successfully, I might add. So thank you for that. And I've taken it on this year and we've got Secret Santa on the go. We think we've got about 35 people doing Secret Santa this year. So we're all making little gifts like quite small little things but it's really nice to receive something when you're so far away from home it's nice to receive something from one of your friends and have that like Christmas element of like coming together and you know showing your appreciation for one another through gift giving so that's a really nice element that we're doing this season and I think the thing that's really interesting with the secret Santa is obviously you can't go and buy something in the shops uh you've got to actually use a bit more imagination with the tools we've got uh, on offer on station to to craft something together for somebody. So this is my first year jumping into partaking in Secret Santa. Did you not do it last year? Oh, no, I didn't do it last year. I'm very, Shame on you. Very embarrassed. I've got a nice idea that I'm trying to put together, but it, it's involving learning some new skills. So I'm speaking to some of our electronics engineers and some of our plumbers and people from tech services to just help me learn to craft the idea I have in my mind. So it's... um. Yeah, you've got to be a bit more imaginative with uh, with gift giving down here, but it's quite good fun and you get to learn some new skills at the same time. There is definitely something really special about not having shops in Antarctica. And Matt, I would like to have a picture of your gift, please. It actually sounds quite like midwinters in terms of the resources that are not necessarily available to you as they would be in the inverted commas real world. You have to really get creative. How does this compare to midwinter? Joe and Aurelia, you've both spent a winter in Antarctica. So how does that compare to midwinter celebrations? Yeah, well, I kind of think midwinters is our our true Christmas at winter. It's it's kind of a bigger celebration because in midwinters it's marking that midway point through the darkest months of the year and the most isolated months of the year because in that winter period you don't have as many people on station. I think I had about twenty three. Yeah, we had twenty six. So you're in that like lower range of people, because whereas at the moment the station is full, we've got like one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty people on station. So. It's kind of a quieter, more intense Christmas, that midwinters week. And you're making gifts again there. That's a tradition that we do at midwinters, making each other gifts. But I have to say, those are probably larger gifts than what we're aiming for for Secret oh, Santa. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Secret Santa is more a little like a thought that counts, whereas midwinter, obviously, it, you know, it's not to put pressure on people, but some people go to extraordinary lengths to put something amazing together and other people put something small together but they really really go into it and like Matt said learn some new skills potentially not everyone's creative in the same way so the fact that people are participating in this and are prepared to to learn something new and to put thought into it that in itself already counts it doesn't really matter what the outcome of the present is some of the midwinter gifts are extraordinary and will stay with you for the rest of your life some are nice and you'll put them somewhere but it's kind of the thought that counts and the fact that someone made this for you and dedicated hours to putting this together and you're going to keep it for the rest of your life somewhere and it's just this little reminder of the community this little reminder of this caring for others and making do with what you've got on station that really counts yeah and that is the difference with uh, midwinters and christmas as well is it's a busy time of year in the summer, so you've got less time to make these gifts, but it's still that thought. And it's that thought of taking the time out of your evening where you could just be relaxing, you could be going for a ski, you could be putting effort into yourself and actually taking time to put effort into somebody else. Is, it really makes a really nice community spirit. So yeah, Christmas is lovely, but uh, midwinters is also lovely, but they're both very different 
in terms of the communities that you've got around you at that time. And what about food? So because it's the height of summer, you have the Sir David Attenborough that was able to bring in fresh produce to the station compared to midwinter where there's no fresh food available. What's happening in the kitchen? Well, I think the chefs are always pretty busy in the kitchen. Uh, yeah, as you say, we've had the Sir David Attenborough come through and uh, do a big supply run for us. Uh, so we're all stocked up with all the, the goodies that we usually like now. So the food certainly changed a little bit. It's, uh, it's nice to have a bit of variety through the week. So uh, we've got a team of uh, five chefs, I think we've got this year, four, four chefs. They're working hard all through the hours of the day. Um, I'm not sure what they've got lined up for us tonight um but in terms of christmas uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> i i do joe knows <laughs> i know a bit more about christmas i think this year for christmas what we're doing was doing like banquet style we're going to set up the dining room nice decorate it all and there's going to be banquet style tables correct me if i'm wrong yep that's correct and um, we're going to do a big sit down christmas lunch at about three o'clock in the afternoon hopefully most people will have the day off that day and they'll be able to come and enjoy christmas lunch and have crackers, hopefully. Hopefully yeah. we've still got some crackers yeah. left. Yeah, crackers came in on the uh, Sir David Attenborough. Perfect. And then we're going to have our like traditional Christmas dinner. So last year there was absolute disaster because no one could find the turkey. So we had turkey delivered last year and it was in one of the reefers. I don't know if you guys remember this. Yeah, yeah, but they couldn't They couldn't take the... There was a they hunt. There was a hunt for the turkey and the they, couldn't, they didn't find it. Yeah. And then if they found it, it wouldn't have... There wouldn't have been enough time to defrost it. And what's reefer, sorry, just for the listeners? The reefer is the freezer container. So that has all of our frozen food in. Um, so they all come containerized. So they're like basically just massive freezers. Because although it's Antarctica and it's cold outside, we can't just leave our food outside because A, in some parts of Antarctica, if you leave your food outside, it actually gets freezer burn. So when it gets too cold. But here we also have um, a marine environment. So it's actually a bit warmer here. And we can get really bright sunshine, especially with that 24 hour daylight. So food could go bad. So even though it's cold, we still do need to use freezers. And we've also got some birds around the station and some seals, (laughs) and especially the skewers, which are a type of uh, predatory gull, they would just come and actually dig into those sausages. So we need to protect our food also from the wildlife. And obviously we can't you know, we need to protect the wildlife from eating our human food. Yeah, it's true. Did you find the turkey? No, they never found it. Last year, there was no turkey. We never found it. I'm not too sure what kind of style of food we're going to have this uh, season. I think it's probably going to be fairly traditional for the Christmas lunch. It would be amazing if we could fit everyone into the dining room. We are going to work on it. Like Joe has already said, there's a lot of people on station, so it's going to be tight. But I think that will be really nice to get everyone together for the same sitting. You know, then we can put more effort into that one big meal. And then in the evening, we're going to have a buffet style dinner, which I think will be really nice. We're going to open the bar. People are going to be able to um, enjoy a few drinks and go to the buffet and generally just relax, be merry and yeah, really get into that Christmas spirit. And everyone's got some smart clothes to wear as well. So people dress up. I've got a funny Christmas tie that's got a picture of a reindeer on it that says Merry Chris Moose, which I, I think is quite funny, but not many other people do. But yeah, we'll all, we'll all dress up as well. We've got No, various... I think that's great, Matt. That's great. Thank you, Nadia. <laughs> um... Don't humour him. <laughs> I'm secretly laughing behind the microphone. Will you be working on Christmas Day? Yeah, it depends on what the operational tempo is looking like. I think the overall plan is most of us should have a day off on on that day. We always have people out in the field at this time of year. So in my team, we'll just we go up and check in with them every three hours during the day. So if there's no other flying operations going on, we'll we'll go up to do that. We've got a few other shift workers that will be responsible for certain other things. But I think overall, uh, the plan is to have a day off for most people at the moment. Yes, so overall we're going to Christmas day is the Monday, which is actually going to be really nice because people will be able to have most people will be able to have the Sunday off, which is Christmas Eve and then Monday Christmas day as well. Like Matt said, there'll be a few key people who are working actively and because we are a remote community and provide our own emergency response, there will always be people who are theoretically on call, so Our um, medical response team will obviously be on call and our tech service team who are looking after, you know, our critical services, they'll obviously be on call. If something happens, we're going to have to respond to that. But hopefully we'll be able to give everyone a good chunk of downtime and have everyone enjoy the Christmas spirit and just a little bit of time, a little bit of downtime, go skiing, maybe put a football match on. 
Mm. Um, so people, oh, we were thinking of doing a, a game of rounders maybe on the apron. Just something to get people together, get them out of their usual the work atmosphere and try to make the station as cosy as possible. And can we just talk about the rounders bat briefly, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I would like to know, is the rounders bat still there? And can we just tell the story about how it's fabricated? Hopefully it's still there. I don't think anyone's actually checked yet, but the plan is to do rounders. And if it isn't, we'll have to, you know, manufacture another one. But, um, well, I mean, Nadia, you made it, right? Or you you employed somebody to make it. <laughs> I don't know... Uh, who actually ended up making yeah, it? Yeah, I, I commissioned the Carpenter Carl to make a rounders bat on, on the lathe. On the lathe, a wooden bat. Oh, sorry, I thought it was public knowledge, but a wooden bat was created in Antarctica in a carpenter's shed for the purpose of rounders. So I am absolutely thrilled sitting here in Cambridge to hear that the legacy of rounders will continue in the Christmas theme. Let's move on to people in the field. Matt, you touched on the fact that you'll be speaking every three hours on SCEDS. That's what you call the communication line via the high-frequency radio of people into the field. What's it like for those that will not be on station and able to participate in these wild celebrations that you've been discussing? Well, I think maybe Jay will be able to go into a bit more detail about what what life's like in the field because I've not spent a great deal of time out there. But um, basically, uh, we get weather observations from them every couple of hours even on a, a, a day off in the field, just in case we need to send a, a plane through them. But overall, on Christmas Day, I'd expect they'll have some downtime. We have this thing called field party requests, where the field teams send us requests for supplies and things. So we'll have a plane that flies to them just before Christmas, and we can um, probably top them up with some special Christmas goodies and things like that. But I, I think... Joe, have you been out in the field for Christmas or can so you shed some more I've not light? been around for actual Christmas Day, but I have been out around Christmas time. And I know for a fact that there are Christmas decorations in our summer field camps out uh, in the field, which is quite exciting. So I'm expecting when I go to Sky Blue this afternoon that if the tree isn't up, I will be putting it up. There is a Christmas tree in Sky Blue, which is one of our like fuel depots that we use to get scientists and fuel deeper into the field and fly our planes into the most remote parts of Antarctica. We also have another... Antarctic petrol station, as I like to think of it, at um, a place called Fossil Bluff, which is on Alexander Island, which is just south of us. And again, there they have tinsel. I've seen the tinsels. We made paper chains last time I was there for Christmas. So that was pretty nice. Often through the FBR, they also send out tiny um, Christmas cakes. Yeah. So they make these baby. Well, I guess they're not baby size. They are like normal family size, whereas we make these huge ones for the station where they get like a normal size Christmas cake the chefs make that gets sent out to the field so they can enjoy some as well. Also, sneak peek, we're going to try and do some caroling again for the field party. So we go to, in the evening, I try and organise a few people who are um, who are keen Christmas carolers and singers and get them up to the tower to where Matt's going to speak to the field parties on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day. And uh, we're going to do some unsolicited Christmas caroling to them. Um, some enjoy it. Some <laughs> don't enjoy it so much because they're quite happy to escape the Christmas world and the Christmas spirit being in the field. But that usually goes down quite well. And uh, yeah, that's really nice. It's quite an interesting environment in the tower where we have 20 or 30 people in the tower singing through one little microphone on the HF radio. But I imagine on the other side, it's a bit of a surreal experience where you've got no internet or anything, just a little radio system. And you can hear a bunch of people singing over the radio. I think it must sound... Uh, I reckon it's quite nice and serene. Although in saying that, I do remember being on the HF before and like the HF isn't always that great. So it's it's very much, so it's a high frequency radio. So it, it's disturbed by things in the atmosphere. So there could be things to do with solar flares can affect it. Also the weather can affect it. You know, there's lots of different things that can affect its quality. And I remember being in the field and hearing a bunch of people singing down at one point this wasn't at Christmas I think this was just some spontaneous singing from really? Monterey at one point and I remember hearing it and being like what are they even trying to say like and like it breaking up but you got the general vibe of there was a song trying to be delivered um, in some format which was which was nice well hopefully the Christmas vibe can be uh, can come across suitably even yeah. if they can't hear anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah on the other end they'll get a bit of a dodgy message and just to clarify what you said earlier the FPR is that field party request that the field parties then submit their uh, food requirements or any games or any fun things to get to the field so of course you're in Antarctica all the time that's your life you live and work with the people which as we all know is very intense how do you strike a work-life balance 
how do I strike a work-life balance? I think it's really important down here to try and make sure that you do have a balance because things do get pretty busy and intense down here. So it's important to try and take that downtime. For me, I try and make sure I go for a nice walk around the point, as Joe and uh, Ray mentioned earlier. It's nice to see all the wildlife, uh, get a good view of the icebergs and just get away from the view of station. And you can just uh, have a bit of time to yourself or go for a walk with a friend or something and and have a chat. So it's important for me to try and do that a couple of times a week. (laughs) It's been a a pretty busy season for me so far, so I've not managed to get in quite as much skiing as I would like. But um, I'm hoping that the the busy, intense time we've been having the last couple of weeks is going to quieten down soon. I can get out for a bit more skiing. Yeah, the skiing is a really nice way to get out and be in the snow and appreciate the environment and get a, like a different view on station. So, yeah, I think one of my things that I do to relax is going for a Nordic ski. So going up to Skiway Col. Nads, we used to do that lots when you were here. So I miss having my uh, my Nordic buddy. But that, I think, is a really nice way yep, to just I miss like that too. Oh, well, soon, maybe if you ever come back, uh, we can do it again. But yeah, it's a really nice way to go and you know, be physically active and and relax whilst in an, an amazing surrounding and view. There's lots of things that you can do here as well to relax in terms of we've got lots of craft rooms, lots of sewing opportunities. We have a knit club and we've got all the movies and things as well. So definitely trying to work out a balance between work and um, recreation is really important on station. But there's lots of options. You just have to find the time to do it. And also the energy. I, I often find that I'm just tired at the end of the day. But yeah, as soon as you put that energy in, you definitely get the reward out for what you're experiencing and seeing. Yeah, I think it's really important, like Joe and Matt are saying, to strike this work-life balance because especially in our three jobs, they are very reactive. So it could be that at any point in time, something happens and we need to be stood up to respond to something. Myself, I never get to shut off my radio, so I always need to be available in case there is an emergency or in case something happens and uh, someone needs my input. So for me, it's really important to make sure I take time off proactively and potentially if there's a little bit of a lull in activity, I just go off, even if it's during the middle of the day or if it's you know not the weekend, if it's just a Wednesday, take that day off and try to relax, try to restore um, my battery Because you never know when things are going to pick up again. And it might be that there is something happens and you need to be completely on it for the next three, four, five days. And then you can't really take any downtime. So it's really important to be well rested. It's important to sleep well here, especially with the 24 hour daylight. It's important to get a good sleep routine in, look after your sleep hygiene and eat well as well, exercise well and Basically, just make sure you're you're ready to go at all times. So there's not really an excuse to run yourself down and then have to take time off. It's more a case of look after yourself, be proactive in, in taking time off, be proactive in looking after yourself, um, which I try to instill in people. It's really difficult because the kind of people we get here, they they are here because they are passionate about the Antarctic and they are passionate about the work that we do. So they want to achieve as much as possible. So sometimes it is my job to try and rein people in and stop them a little bit and make sure they take some downtime to be rested because they they might be deployed into the field immediately or they might have to do a big job that has come up uh, in case something one of our infrastructure fails or something so that's important and it's not always easy to get people to take time off down here so again uh, that's why the christmas period is really important as a as a time to really make sure people take that break and uh, and recover and slow down a little bit it just shows the importance of needing that management when there are so many people with many objectives, many goals. And you, like you say, being in Antarctica, you want to just make the most of it. But pacing is so important. How do you maintain morale on station? I think between all of us, we all we all kind of manage morale in, in, in different ways. I think it's just like working anywhere else in some ways people have good days people have bad days it's it's exactly the same down here it's just important to do some of these activities where we're getting away from work joe's mentioned about the rounders we had a big game of football on the apron um the other day and so it's just i think the way to keep morale where we'd like it is to bring people together and just do, do activities that help people bond better and can just have a bit of a laugh let your hair down a little bit so I I think those are the important things to try and increase and just keep morale at a nice level where we like it yeah and we've got lots of people that organize lots of social things like quizzes and things to get people involved and excited on station 
And uh, a bit of competition is never a bad way to motivate people. So we have launched our annual balloon competition yet again this year. So part of the meteorological team's job here is to launch weather balloons. And we launch them every day and they're collecting data about temperature, about wind direction and pressure and humidity and all these things. And they basically are helium balloons that we fill up and they rise up into the air, collecting all of this data and getting a vertical snapshot. And we've got some key aspects that we need to reach for this scientific data to be mostly valuable. And that is to reach the pressure level of 100 hectopascals at 12 o'clock GMT. So we've got a competition on at the moment where people can come along with one of us and launch one of these balloons and try and reach that goal. And there's a bit of rivalry between people on station. And I think that's a nice way of motivating people to get involved in some of the tasks we do down here that aren't necessarily part of their job, but some of the really important science tasks that we're doing down here as well. And also with the boat trips that we do. So the marine team are always going out and they're always asking for people, do you want to come and help with a um, a CTD, which is a conductivity temperature temperature? depth depth um sampling that they do um so it's really a good way to motivate people and be passionate about why we're here like the reason we're all here is to support um, polar science and you know support that data set that we're collecting so it's a really important way to motivate people for why we're here you know we get people from all different backgrounds who are they might be part of the construction they might be a plumber they might be an electrician they might be a scientist or a pilot but we're all here trying to pursue that one goal and support our science teams and our strives that we're trying to make in the um, polar environment yeah I think what Joe's mentioning that that's so from my level, that's how I want to motivate people is by putting into context what they do on a daily basis and how that contributes to our overall goal and why it is so important that you are putting that food on the table every single day. And why is it that important that you are making sure the sewage treatment plant works or, you know, you're driving a vehicle around on station delivering goods from A to B. All of these things uh, might seem trivial to the person during the day when they've been doing it for weeks and weeks on end. But actually putting it into perspective that what you're doing here is making sure sh- that is facilitating, you know, people's science and that is helping us support our overall goals of understanding better the effects that um, climate change is having on Antarctica, but also understanding Antarctica in its role in the global climate uh, more and more. That's really important. And, you know, reminding people of that and also just appreciating people and their work, giving thanks to people and making sure everyone feels valued and their input feels valued is really important. So that's a kind of more like activities are really important, but often that's a sort of instant gratification that happens. But making people feel valued, making people feel heard and making people feel like they're a part of something bigger that we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, that's how I think people we can Mm. keep people motivated. It always helps to put some chocolate out. It always helps to make sure the fizzy drinks keep flowing and the weather is good. But sometimes just reminding people of the overall reason why we're here and what we all contribute individually, that has that's quite powerful. That is absolutely crucial, especially because the ratio of scientists to support staff is so much greater towards the support staff side. And yes, we do hear a lot about the science that comes out from Antarctica, but the absolute reality is there's so many people that are necessary to make just that one bit of data collection possible and the fact that it can even happen. So it is absolutely crucial. What do your families think about your lives in Antarctica? Well, I know my mum always says she's very proud of me. Um, but yeah, I think it's, they're all pretty excited. It's, um, especially when you first tell your family that you've you've picked up a job in the Antarctic, it's uh, something quite unique. Your friends and family are definitely pretty excited for you. It is difficult at times, though. For me, I'm I'm down here for about five and a half months a season. So that's quite difficult with uh, being away from family for so long. But uh, I think between us, we've figured out a way to make it work. As long as you stay in good communication, making sure you're phoning your mum once a week and letting her know what's uh, what's going on, because mums are all, always interested in what their what their sons are up to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's uh, having good comms with the family. Yeah, definitely. Communication is like really key down here to staying back home. But I remember when I first told my mum that I'd got the job when I've been told I'd got it. And she was like, oh, and I was like, oh, I don't know whether I should go because I was committing to a winter. So my first season I was coming down, the contract was going to be for, um, I think it's for 21 months with like 18 ish months in Antarctica. I ended up doing actually 16 and most people tend to do a year. But 
I remember talking to my mum and being like, oh, I don't know whether to accept it. I'm not uh, like, it's quite a long period of time. And my mum was like, well, I would never go. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So my mum says she would never go. And then my dad was the exact opposite. And he was like, you have to go. There is no way you're not going. You've got to go. And I think it's like, I had a bit of that juxtaposition between my two parents, but they were both in the end, like, you know, this is something that you want to do. Like, you need to just do it. We will still be here and life will go on without you. But this opportunity is only going to be here now and you might never get it again. So you need to take that opportunity and, and live for your own life. And I think that's the biggest thing for my parents is that they they were very much like, you know, being away for that period of time. Yes, people might get ill. Yes, bad things might happen back home, which is really difficult to deal with when you're so far away. But, you know, you have to also well my parents and my family anyway are very much like you need to live your life and do do what you want to do and this is definitely what I want to do and I have no regrets in coming at all and I think yeah if anyone's thinking about going down to Antarctica and working down here I would definitely recommend working down here if it's something you've been interested in and that you've got all the skills and the the uh, tenacity to be down here then I would say it's definitely a, a very unique and fun opportunity. I think it's definitely the best decision uh, that I've made and whilst as a Aurelia was kind of mentioning earlier I'm a very small part in something that's really quite big and I you know it's nice to know that I'm part of this community that's that's doing a lot of really important work so yeah that fills me with with the purpose I'm here to to get on with stuff. Excellent and thank you so much for those really great insights have you got any final thoughts or messages for people at home? Well I think as we're approaching the Christmas period I guess it's a it's a happy Christmas to everyone at home. Yeah. Um, we're saying it's you know we're always away for Christmas down here this is the busiest time of year so yeah happy Christmas to everyone enjoy time with your friends and family that's the most important thing we'll be speaking to our friends and family when we can yeah as well. exactly season's greetings to everyone and um we will definitely be having a white Christmas here um I'm not sure how it's looking back home for a white Christmas at the moment but um Fingers crossed that some people back home rainy. will have a white Christmas. Oh, rainy. Okay. Less good if it's rainy, but I mean, it's all about coming together and we'll definitely be coming together as a community down here and I'm sure everyone back home will be as well. So there's definitely elements of Christmas I'm going to miss back home, like meeting up with family and friends. But yeah, a really good Christmas to everyone back home and uh, hopefully have a happy new year and prosperity in the new year as well. I just want to say fröhliche Weihnachten to all the German speakers out there and don't let yourself get bogged down by stress and buying Christmas presents and all that kind of stuff this year. Just appreciate being with family or friends or loved ones or just feeding on that community spirit and just think a little bit more about though what it's all about underneath and just being together and enjoying some amazing food and have a wonderful time. Beautiful messages from beautiful people. Matt Hughes, Joe Cole, Aurelia Highchard, thank you very much for your time. Do check out the Beyond the Ice blog on the British Antarctic Survey website and my podcast too, Ice World. I'm Nadia Frontier. We'll have another of these podcasts for you on the 28th of December when I'll be joined by the captain of the Sir David Attenborough. So we'll be looking forward to that. Thanks for listening.